uh, this is my conflict of interest, and some of this may be relevant because I'll be talking about the uh, total hepatoplasty. The question I've been assigned by uh, Klaus is which approach is best for young patients undergoing total hepatoplasty. I assume by that the surgical approach, I would probably tell you that it's the gluteal sparing approach is the best, and then I would probably go and sit down. But uh, I have given the chance to perhaps discuss a few of the issues related to total hepatoplasty in young patients. One of the issues is the timing, and I think uh, we've heard great uh, talks this morning regarding total hepatoplasty and also joint preservation procedure. I think we need to realize that total hip replacement is a different operation today than it used to be back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Some of our patients who have real problems, they should probably have the surgery, and it's not a good idea to hold off total hip hyperplasty in some of these very young patients because of fear of uh, wear and osteolysis. Examples I'll give you is uh, patients like this 13-year-old, severe pain, limb length discrepancy. She had sickle cell and underwent core decompression. She's on narcotic at age 13, can't go to school because everybody's laughing at her. She wears that shoe. She's got a limb length discrepancy of about seven centimeters, can't sleep at night, and this is her hip. Now, it is tempting to uh, say no to a patient who's at 13 and not to operate on her, but I think total hepatoplasty is a great operation, restores function to these patients and returns them back to the society. As it happened in this particular patient, she did extremely well. And in fact, actually she's done so well that she's now trying for the Olympics, she's a discus thrower. So I think it's important for us not to hold off given this uh, operation to patients when the time is right. I think it's important not to get too fancy with the operations that don't work. Operations such as these, they get um, a lot of these patients unfortunately don't really improve that much if they've got to a point of total um, uh, uh, degenerative changes these patients are better off with a total hip replacement than undergoing joint preservations that don't work. And unfortunately, joint preservations that don't work burn the bridge sometimes, and we've just heard some uh, talks this morning, putting patients through trochanteric osteotomy, putting patients uh, with huge hardware such as this one. When they in, then uh, end up at your hands, you've got to then look for diaphyseal fixation stems have the problem of removing that hardware, increasing the chance of infection, et cetera. So if a patient has severe degenerative joint disease, I don't really think it matters how old they are, they should undergo total hip replacement. And operations that don't work put these patients at a huge risk of having problems down the line. For example, this patient underwent two prior uh, trochanteric osteotomies, none of which worked. And when then she comes for that surgery, you've got to deal with the issues and then you have to lose a much use a much longer stem in order to bypass those stress risers in this patient. Surgical approach, I think we've made huge strides in the past few years. Uh, material improvements, we've just heard a good talk from John about the highly crossing polyethylene that has changed the game to a large extent. Anesthetic, surgical approach, pain control, a lot of uh, innovations have, made, have been made and we will continue to make more of these innovations and changes. And I think in life you can belong to two camps. Either you are the status quo camp that you think the current situation is perfect, there's no need for innovations, or you strive to make things better. And I think improving surgical approach is one of those innovations that, has, that have come. And these advances have brought us to where we are today. And physicians are, uh, by uh, nature, innovators. And if you look at what we have accomplished in other fields of surgery, it is, uh, it is fairly spectacular. When I was a resident in England, I remember seeing these uh, cholecystectomies done through transcostal uh, approaches. These patients were in hospital for two weeks. They would have severe pain. They had issues. They had complications. And in those early days, remember what happened with the laparoscopic surgeries, there were a huge number of negative papers regarding laparoscopic per surgery and how bile ducts were being injured and how venous, uh, inferior vena cava were being ruptured, etc. But they persisted, and I think that approach definitely prevailed because now cholecystectomy is done through very, very small approach, and these patients go home outpatient operation. Surgical approach is one of those. In fact, one of the first papers written on surgical approach was by Dick Rothman. Dick Rothman learned the transgluteal approach 
during Trochanteric osteotomy from John Charnley. He came back. He continued to do those. And Dick has over 1,000 patients that he's operating on through, through transgluteal approach. And he tells me that it used to take him about 20 minutes to try to close these hips because he had to do the box technique to try to get the great trochanter back on. So he randomized patients to two approaches, transgluteal using the uh, uh, trochanteric osteotomy versus the Harding approach when you didn't take down the uh, gluteals, uh, the great trochanter. And sure, sure enough, there was no difference in outcome. He abandoned the use of uh, 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 greater trochanter osteotomy and they moved into the soft tissue operation. I think that was a great accomplishment in the back, back in the 1980s. So it is important for us to continue to innovate, but it's also important for us to uh, make sure that we evaluate these technologies properly and not just jump on any bandwagon and put our patients at risk. And for example, the advances that have come, you know, again on the uh, AAA, this is uh, AAA, how it was done uh, through the long transabdominal approach, and now, of course, it's a very different operation than it used to be. As far as the uh, surgical approach, I think learning curve is a very, very important one, and I think, Klaus, you have just very beautifully highlighted the importance of, uh, and so did Richard D. Steiger when they wrote, it is very important that not to do this. If you are a surgeon who does only 20, 30 hip replacements a year, probably the direct anterior is not the approach. And then uh, direct anterior compared to transgluteal approach have performed very, very well. So I'm not sure if that happens to be the case for, uh, for many invasive posterior, posterolateral approach where you take down the short rotators and you're careful enough to close the capsule. I think those patients do fine. But I will say in Klaus's uh, slides that he was showing, I, it is our experience also that patients who've had direct lateral approach when abductors are taken down, some of these patients continue to have permanent limp and they never come back. And in fact, our own CEO was operated through that approach in our, uh, and we see him limp around like a duck every day because I think his abductors never healed. So transabductor approach for the young patient is probably not a great idea. Direct anterior in our hands, low bleeding, less postoperative pain for sure. As you heard from Bill yesterday, majority of these patients go home the same day. They are on um, uh, sh small amounts of narcotics. There's a short length of stay. They have faster functional recovery. We have published on those multiple places. And believe it or not, it's actually a much shorter, shorter operation in our hands. The other uh, uh, advantages is a quick setup. You don't have to position these patients on the lateral approach, waiting to get the shoulder bags, etc., And um, it allows us to really save about 10 to 15 uh, minutes for each of these patients. In a patient like that that I just showed you with, very, with uh, what we call reactive scoliosis, these are tough to do through the side because uh, you will get their limb lengths probably not right. And as you can all see, this is not a true limb length discrepancy. This is all because of pelvic obliquity. And it's great to do these through the front. You can just use your landmarks, put the hip, and after a while, once their pain has gone away, the reactive scoliosis resolves. Direct anterior allows us to do these through uh, bilat uh, do bilateral total hips under the same anesthesia. You can position them. You can prep both of their legs and do an operation like this for that 15-year-old who has unfortunately vascular necrosis secondary to treatment of uh, the, uh, leukemia. And this again provides them with function immediately. She'd been in a wheelchair for a long time. And once you do the bilaterals, they're able to get back on their function and start to move around. You saw from yesterday how beautiful that acetabular exposure is through direct anterior approach. And I think as much majority of these young patients suffer from dysplasia, it allows you to expose the acetabulum very easily and work on the acetabulum, including bone grafting of the acetabulum you can do a lot of the work in the acetabulum, including the use of posterior plates if you wish. But that's a very um, uh, good approach for the acetabulum. It also, because you don't have to dislocate, allows you to deal with complex problems like this, where this patient had a prior head injury and unfortunately motor vehicle accident, and he's got autoankylosis. Very difficult to do this through other approaches because you have to cut this hip inside you and then try to mobilize this. And unfortunately, that uh, is very close to the neurovascular structure. So it's a bit of a, a difficult operation doing it through other approaches. 
But if you do it through direct anterior approach, you don't have to dislocate. You can move the head, then concentrate on the uh, removal of that heterotopic ossification. Another advantage uh, is that it allows us, especially in uh, Philadelphia, where we uh, have more lawyers than human beings, and uh, limb length discrepancy is one of the major causes for uh, litigation, allows you to come to the end of the, uh, uh, the table and measure their limb length very easily. Because they're not on their side, it's very easy. And anesthesia love this approach because they have direct access to these patients. Bearing surface is the other issue. I'll tell you, I agree with whatever has been said today. I actually use Biolox Delta, 28 millimeter, with a very, very thick poly. I prefer to use the trabecular metal in some of these patients. I would uh, urge those of you using the um, titanium foam to follow these patients very closely. There's a signal that the uh, trabecular titanium is uh, associated with very high radiolucency at this point and uh, please follow your patients very carefully. So if you're using titanium foam with all manufacturers, and not just one single manufacturer, they're having very terrible results. I think that Delta Ceramic with highly crusting polyethylene, especially very thick, is a match made in heaven. Works well, as long as you put the stem in the right place, and as long as you only use one femoral head, that's <laughs> preferable. And then uh, it, in terms of the ceramic, it provides, uh, you know, I use ceramic, I've been using ceramic uh, since day one. I started my practice 15 years ago. I really believe ceramic does avoid some of the issues that we just heard today. I don't use ceramic on ceramic in these patients. I just don't think it's worthwhile. It works well doing ceramic on highly crossing polyethylene. I never put a metal on metal on any of the patients, and hence I don't have to deal with the issue of the metal on metal, or for that matter, hey, I don't go too I don't yeah, go too fancy Brad with Morgan the um, um, stuff, as Dr. Hey, Wenger said. Fetch. Use tried and tested stuff. Don't go with these modern uh, things <laughs> unless. Piper, you're such a smart dog. So, uh, what can your dog do, Fergus? Bud Light. <laughs> I think so the tried and tested works well no point in going after fancy stuff and I agree with Klaus especially if you change your approach do not change the implants and use the things that have worked in your hands and have worked in the registries there's no reason that you should be using anything else I do put the cups very horizontal I think uh, we've seen McCallop and others have shown that a vertical cup in the young patients is a bad idea. So a horizontal cup not only protects them against the instability, it actually improves wear in these patients. And then finally, activities in these patients. I don't limit their activities. I think they do well without limiting their activities. As long as they're reasonable with their activities, I just tell them not to run marathons, but they can do whatever they want. And I think the majority of these patients have very good outcome. As long as they are reasonable. Thank you very much. Thank you.